You see that um, whole bunch of... It looks like a, an island. Those trees right there, that was an island. <laughs> they said that all in this area, it was like a, a blue blanket on each side of the river. That was blueberries. They had tons of blueberries here, all over this way, over that way. So it was just beautiful here until they did this. Look at this, oh my gosh. It's awful, dirty, stinks. I don't think we realize how big of a problem it was until recently we're starting to, they were start talking about the the storage of arsenic underground and we never knew how dangerous it was or what they were actually doing here. The arsenic that they left behind, which is stored underground, is probably the size of it's a 10-story building and seven of those buildings. That's how much is stored underground. But that's a lot of arsenic. We could probably kill the whole world a few times over. They're trying to figure out what to do with it and it is here forever and can't seem to imagine that forever, you know? What about our, my goodness, our future generations is gonna be left with this. And even in the beginning when they were starting to mine the area, they've never ever consulted the people. They've never said anything to the people that, that this is what they're doing and this is how they're taking it out and this is what's been um, left behind. Now, only after the fact that they had left that we started to find these things out and it's awful. It's not very good. A giant mine at Yellowknife goes down 750 feet. There are a number of processes, all equally important and the actual mining of the rock is only the first. The ore now starts its journey through the surface plant. It falls down into a breaker that pounds the rock down to the size of small stones. After crushing, the ore is sifted through vibrating screens, oversize being returned automatically. Finally, the ore reaches the mill and is poured into huge bins. A complicated process is required to extract the metal from the rock. From the bin, the ore is drawn through a massive ball mill where it is ground to a powder. From here, in the form of a heavy gray pulp, it is pumped to another part of the mill for chemical treatment. From the reagent floor, various reagents are introduced to start a process of separation. Beside the roaster is the Cottrell plant. 75,000 volts are used here to recover the arsenic from the roaster fumes for safe disposal. My name is Kevin O'Reilly and I moved to Yellowknife in 1985. I was on city council here from 1997 to 2006 and that was a period when Giant Mine went into receivership. Since then I've worked for a variety of federal, territorial, nonprofit organizations and my work on Giant Mine now is currently with Alternatives North. Well, Giant Mine, there was mineral exploration in the area in the 1930s but uh, they figured there was something there but it became an operating mine in 1948 and uh, it was a gold roasting operation. It finally uh, closed in 1999 when it went into receivership. That was the, the end of the, uh, the mine. What we have left on this site is uh, 100 buildings. There's uh, a number of uh, tailings ponds. There's 95 hectares. But of course, the big legacy is the 237,000 tons of arsenic trioxide that is stored underground and it's in uh, 15 old mined out stopes, as they call them, chambers. To put that into perspective, that's seven and a half times the size of a 10-story building. So it's a lot of arsenic trioxide. It's probably enough to kill all the humans on the planet a couple of times over, so it's a lot of uh, toxic material. Part of removing the gold involved a processing that released the arsenic that was already in the rock. The arsenic that was in the rock wasn't going anywhere or interacting with anyone. But when it was released in processing, it became a, a powdered form that was highly water soluble. So uh, arsenic trioxide, it's uh, a proven human carcinogen. 
to non-threshold carcinogens, which means any exposure is not good. And uh, it's also highly soluble in water. We know that water is getting into the mine now and starting to dissolve away some of that arsenic trioxide that's stored underground. But the water does go down into the bottom of the mine where it's stored. It's pumped up above ground and treated. But there's certainly a lot there underground. And if there was a, a catastrophic release, it would not be a pretty sight. So we don't want that to ever happen. Underground, in a number of underground uh, chambers and, and mined out stopes, there's 237,000 tons of arsenic trioxide. There's also arsenopyrite in tailings. So that's in process tailings. That's on the surface, spread of an area of over 200 football fields, um, as deep as 70 feet thick. There are 13 and a half million tons of arsenopyrite contaminated tailings. The arsenic in that is still toxic, but it's not in as mobile a form or as soluble a form as is in the arsenic chambers underground. As well, between the chambers, there are several kilometers of underground workings, which have arsenic and other contaminants in them too. The chambers that I've described that have the arsenic trioxide underground, they used to have permafrost around them. The ground was frozen. The disturbance from mining, among other things, has caused the permafrost to thaw. The proposal is to make what they're calling a freeze wall around the chambers, where you drill several kilometers of, of uh, tubes around the, the edges of the chambers, and they were also considered underneath the chambers, depending on how the freezing functions. And then using a technology that's a lot like a, a skating rink, um, to use power to create cooling to make a frozen wall that's at least 10 meters thick in the rock around the chambers. And then once that was up and running, they were going to use a, a technology called a thermosiphon, which is a a tube with no moving parts except for a gas inside it that takes heat out efficiently. And so without electricity added to that part, it can take heat from underground and dissipate it. It's, it's temperature dependent. It depends on the climate, among other things. Um, they need to be replaced periodically. But they don't need a lot of regular intervention or maintenance. And they've been known to work in the north well for periods ranging from 30 to 70 years. They're used at the diamond mines. You'll see some at the legislature here as well. Now, this proposal was intended to partly stabilize the site now to make it safe, but they want this to work over perpetuity, that this would keep on working forever, to use their, their own words, that this is, uh, they have no intention of there being a walk away solution here. Parts of what I've just described would require periodic or constant maintenance. Um, and again, that is forever. Other aspects of the site that will require ongoing care and maintenance, water treatment. No matter what we do with the site, water is going to continue to get in there, move around, dissolve some of that arsenic, and that water has to be treated basically forever. Other aspects, um, the tailings uh, areas out there, there will be some kind of cover put on top of them, a mix of soil and uh, uh, clay liners and so on. Those require inspection and care and maintenance again forever. So the, the thing that's always made me wonder about this is, you know, where is that money going to come from forever to make sure that this gets done? How do we make sure that we've got the skill sets, the people on site, uh, to make that they, with the skills and knowledge to actually carry that work out? Not just now, 10 years from now, but forever. As long as I can remember my grandfather, my, my grandmother telling us stories how they live off the land. In the summer, they would come to Great Slave Lake. In the fall, they would uh, make camp at the Willie Day site, and they would get ready and prepare for winter. The men usually would leave the women and children and the elders behind and go into the Bear Lands. They would hunt and trap up there till about maybe December, and that would be like a cycle. Every year they would do that but they have always lived here. The missionaries came into this area probably in, in about 1700s. We hear stories of them talking about when they first came here 
and they were really afraid of them because they didn't know who they were and well, definitely different skin color. And the elders always told us that there would be more people coming, but we were to work with them, have peace with them. Our word for non-Dene people, the white people, we call them kwe ti. Kwe is rock, ti is people. So the white people's name came when the first prospector came because we remember them as a person that was looking, that wanted the rock. So they remember them as the kwe ti. So they're called rock people to this day. This is Yellowknife where the Yellowknife River runs into the Great Slave Lake, a community created by gold, being continuously changed by gold. It is no longer the small pioneering town of a few years ago. The famous Wildcat Cafe is closed and derelict. The trapper's hut is overgrown with fireweed. The streets are deserted. There is little to indicate that Yellowknife is one of the most flourishing centers of gold mining in Canada. But in the new town, all one sees are signs of prosperity. A fine modern hospital, schools, flourishing stores, comfortable houses. Some 3,000 people live here, and the future is theirs for the making. Early on when I, when I came to Yellowknife, uh, I did hear stories from the elders uh, with the Yellowknife Stanley First Nation and people like Fred Sangris, Isidore Tzeda, um, talk about the changes that they've seen uh, in the landscape here to their traditional territory, to their way of life. 